Day this today, Wednesday, 24 March 2021. I am Zakir from ITS Global Engagement and will be your Master of Ceremony this afternoon. Thank you for joining our guest lecture series on SDGs today. Before we start our agenda, let me remind you of link you need to fill during the event. First, please fill your attendance at bit.ly slash attendance underscore GLS SDGs. Our committee also send the attendance link in the Zoom chat room. For participants who wish to get an e-certificate and STEM, please fill the attendance 15 minutes after the session starts. Second, participants who wish to ask questions during the question and answer session, please send your question to intip.in slash QNAGLSSDGs. The link for question please in the chat room as well, or you can ask directly by clicking the raise hand feature. Today's STEM is water and wastewater engineering and resource efficient sanitation planning with focus on the global zone, which will be delivered by our speakers, Dr. Duratul Ain Holibon from Universitas Teknologi Mara and Ms. Aino Firdatunisa from Institute Teknologi 10 November. The lecture will be moderated by Ms. Dina Maldina Asori from Institute Teknologi 10 November. Before we start our agenda, Allow me to deliver our schedule today as follow. First, opening. Second, introduction to moderator and speakers. Third, lecture session by Prof. Duratul and Ms. Fiyarda. Fourth, q &A session. Fifth, certificate awareness. And the last is closing. Now, before we proceed to the next agenda, let me introduce our moderator. Our moderator is Ms. Nova Maulidina Ashuri. Her educational background is on Master in Biology, Universitas Indonesia, Bachelor in Biology, Institute Technology for November. Her research expertise is on biology conservation, fisheries, and aquaculture. And now she is a junior lecturer at Department Biology, Faculty of Science and Data Analytics. Now, without further ado, let's proceed to the main agenda. To Ms. Dina. The time is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mas Dakir. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, all participants. And uh, uh, Honorable Miss uh, Dr. Turoto Aini, welcome to our uh, agenda. And also Ibu, uh, Ibu Firda, welcome Hi. to our agenda. Uh, I think as uh, before, before the first speaker uh, talking about the lecture today, uh, I will uh, to introduce uh, the first speaker. Uh, for the first speaker is a uh, special speaker is Dr. Duratul Ain Binti Tolibun. Uh, she is from University Technology Mara, Cawangan Pahang Campus Jingka. And for the educational background, uh, at 2016, uh, she is in a PhD from Civil Engineering in Alternative Water Resource University Technology of Mara Selangor. And then uh, before before the PhD uh, for mastery, for master, uh, she is uh, in environment management in also in Malaysia, but in Technology of Malaysia Skudai Johor and for uh, bachelor engineering uh, she, uh, her subject is civil engineering in also in university technology malaysia Kuai johor uh, dr duratul experience and award is uh, at 2007 until 2015 uh, she is lecturer in faculty of civil engineering engineering at U, UITM Perlis and then at 2015 she is a press until now uh, uh, Dr. Durotun is lecturer in uh, Faculty of Civil Engineering in Pahang and uh, 2020 until now uh, she is an uh, editorial board of the International Journal of Asian Education and uh, last year she also got the gold award of virtual research and innovation exhibition in UNIMAP. And her 
Dr. Duroto research interest is about water resources and then river erosion and sedimentation. And I think uh, uh, I will the hand over this uh, agenda directly to Dr. Duroto Ain to uh, deliver the lecture today about uh, wastewater engineering. Please, uh, Dr. Duratun. Uh, oh, yeah. Dr. Duratun, how are you today? Yes, fine. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, maybe it's uh, directly time is yours, doctor, to present your lecture to this afternoon. All right. Uh, okay. I would like to share my uh, screen, okay? Share screen. Can I share my screen uh, now? Uh, I don't think it's yes. working yet, ma'am. Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, you can share screen. I, I can. Uh, wait, I need, I, uh, I want to share my screen, but uh, when I click the share screen, so only one participant can share at one time. So, oh, wait. Uh, do you have, uh, do you have switch, uh, turn off the screen, uh, the committee? Maybe Ms. Yakir, have you already stopped the screen? Stop sharing with. Wait. Um. Uh, yes, I already stopped share. Uh, maybe you can try again. Okay. Wait. Share screen. Mm. All. Who can share all participant? Who can start sharing all participant? Oh, wait. Why what, my screen did not appear? Uh, uh, Dr. Duratul? Yes. Uh, we, we close the share screen already security. Close? However, you are a co host. Yes, yes, you are already a, a co host. So. Please try to. Uh, I just want to make sure that the button is green. The share oh, yes. screen. Yes, the button is uh, the button for share screen is green, yes. and then I click. Okay, now it's appear. All right, wait, wait. <laughs> okay, share. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is that appear? Full screen. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Can. All right. So. Okay. Again. Assalamu alaikum and hi and good afternoon to everyone. Okay, so I am uh, Dr. Duratul Ain, uh, Bede Talibun from UITM, University Technology Mara, Chapang Branch, Malaysia. Okay, so I am a senior lecturer from uh, Water Resource and Environmental Division, Faculty of Civil Engineering. So today my uh, lecture is about water and waste water engineering. Okay, so wait. Okay, so uh, this is the three main topics covered in this uh, chapter. So we have uh, basic hydrology, water resource, and waste water engineering. So, uh, hydrology covers two main categories that is uh, surface water hydrology and ground water hydrology. Okay, so surface water hydrology may tackle the area between the atmosphere and the surface of the earth. So, anyone can give example uh, on how the surface water hydrology. So any one of you can just type in the chat box. 
the example of the uh, surface water hydrology. Anyone can give example? Hello? All right, so I can see the answer from uh, Adeola. So it's such a river, lake, okay? So this uh, is the example uh, of the surface water uh, on top of the, our ground or on top of our earth. So we can see by our naked eyes. So how about the groundwater hydrology? Can anyone answer? Uh, give example of groundwater hydrology? Groundwater. Yes, aquifer and a well. Uh, so we need to dig at some point and then we can get the groundwater. All right. So when we're talking about hydrology, We have hydrological cycle. Okay, so hydrological cycle may involve several process. So when we're talking about cycle, uh, which one do you think uh, the first or the last process? Okay, so anyone can type in the box, in the chat box. Which one of uh, this process uh, is the first process or is there any first process or last process for this hydrological cycle? Anyone can answer from your opinion? Well, uh, Richard, okay, uh, one person, one person, Give a recharge answer. You start with evaporation. Okay, so never mind. So uh, this is the cycle, hydrological cycle. So there are no uh, first and no last because it's a cycle. Okay, so the process is keep repeating over and over again. So without any, uh, without one process, so the another process cannot be. Okay, so let's look on the first process in this cycle. Okay, so for precipitation, so it defined as uh, how much of the water contains that the cloud cannot hold it uh, any longer and it falls to earth. So normally we call it as uh, rainfall, but however, uh, rainfall is it just uh, one example, one form of the precipitation. So there are many other else. For example, we have dew. So uh, dew is like uh, um, happen uh, during our night, uh, during the dawn. Uh, so uh, where the air is much cooler, so there is uh, a dew on the ground. And then the second form is mist. So mist is a tiny droplet of water hanging in the atmosphere, hanging in the air. So this mist, when there is a sunlight, uh, it, dry, it will get dry and evaporate to the atmosphere. And then the third one, we have fog. So the fog is uh, happen due to the uh, moist air mixed with the cooler air. So this fog will just uh, static condition at the in the atmosphere. So when there is sunlight, when there is heat, this fog may evaporate to the atmosphere. All right, and then we have rain. So this is uh, normal happen in our country, in the Asian country, right? So we have uh, a droplet of water uh, of a rainfall in the liquid form. And then uh, we have hail. Hail is like a rainfall, but in a solid condition, solid, solid form, uh, in a upper, in a very 
a larger in a quite larger molecules as compared to the rainfall. And then uh, we have snowfall. So snow is happen uh, when the precipitation is dropped uh, on the ground that have uh, lower uh, that have a very cold uh, temperature. Uh, that is below than uh, uh, zero degree Celsius. So this is the forms of precipitation that normally occur in our Earth. For evaporation, so we can see that the evaporation is when oceans, uh, rivers, lakes, streams heat up and the water turns into vapor and goes back to atmosphere. So it normally, uh, normally happen uh, for the open water body. Uh, for example, this one, uh, we have pond, lakes, and other else. And we also have evapotranspiration. That is the sum of evaporation from the open water body and from the plant, transpiration. So transpiration means that uh, plant have uh, uh, photosynthesis process, having a process, photosynthesis process where it releases the oxygen and water vapor from the leaves. So that water vapor is uh, will uh, call the transpiration process. And then the next process is infiltration, where the precipitation of the rainfall, when it touch the ground, and then it will start to infiltrate. And then the soil will absorb the water and this water will become the groundwater. So that we call the infiltration. So the next process is transpiration. So again, uh, when the water travels through a plant, so the water move up the plant from the roots to an underneath the leaves, meaning that when the water absorbed by the roots and then uh, the water is travel up to the leaf and then it will just uh, release from the leaf okay by you transpiration process next is condensation process where is the water vapor in the air cools and change back into liquid so it means the changes of water vapor to the liquid phase. So the next process, we have the ground water flow. So it is a movement of water that travels and seeps through the soil and rock. Okay, and also we have base flow. That is when the water that being infiltrated into the ground and become the ground water, so that the ground water will trying to travel downwards or trying to travel uh, according to the uh, to to uh, to find the lower direction to find the lower part of the uh, water body so uh, it will become the base flow so how about surface runoff so it is uh, when the water flow that occurs when soil is infiltrated to full capacity and access water from rain, uh, snow melt, and other so sources flows on the land. So meaning that when you have precipitation and it touch the ground, okay, so that when uh, the ground or soil have been fully saturated, meaning that the soil cannot absorb the water anymore. So the excess rainfall or the excess water on top of the soil may flow as a surface runoff. So this normally occurred at the open space like field, uh, road, pavement. Okay, so that water flow, we try to find the lower part or lower direction uh, or, or nearby uh, water body uh, to be to being discharged. All right, so we have stream flow. So stream flow is one uh, term, uh, another term for river, 
uh, streams or channels. Okay. So again, uh, we have uh, base flow that the water, brown water flowing towards the uh, lower part of the water body. All right, that's all about the main components or main, main element of the uh, hydrological cycle. So let's look on the catchment and water budget. So as you can see from this figure, this is the watershed. What does it mean by watershed? It is also called as a catchment area, right? So another term is drainage basin or drainage area. So watershed can vary in size and represent the area draining to a small stream to the entire or uh, draining to an ocean and draining to an ocean. So for the small catchment, we call the stream watershed. For the larger catchment, we call the river basin. Okay, so let's look at this figure. So as you can see here, there is the hills and rivers towards the ocean. So there are the yellow dotted line that is a divider for this watershed area. Okay, and then uh, the rainfall or precipitation that occurred within this area, watershed area, is considered to fill in all the streams that uh, inside this watershed area, inside this catchment. So the upstreams of the river at the mountain peak. So that we call the upstream rivers. So this upstream rivers will flowing into the main river at the main uh, at the midstream. So at this at this midstream is we started to have activities, for example, uh, residential areas, uh, agricultural areas, okay, fishing areas at these midstreams. And then these midstream areas will, uh, will uh, continuing to convey the water towards the downstream river, and now it goes to the ocean. So basically, the water quality at the upstream area is higher as compared to the water quality at the downstream area due to the activities that may occur at their surrounding. So for this figure, we have another term, tributaries. Tributaries is the small rivers that being supplied, that connected to the main river. Okay, so this is the uh, measurement, unit measurement for each of the, uh, for each of the process. It can measure by centimeter, for the depth and also for the rate we have measured by centimeter over time. So why does it important for us to study hydrology? Because we need to determine the water balance. Okay, so we also need uh, to determine uh, for the agricultural use, for irrigation, and then for drinking purpose. And also we need to design our dams for the water supply and hydroelectric power generation. All right, so let's look on the precipitation process. So again, this is all the form of precipitation. So it is estimated that only a quarter of total amount of precipitation that falls on the land surface is returned back to the ocean or uh, direct runoff. Okay. And the balance is thought as the underground water or returned to the atmosphere by evaporation and transpiration. So this is the forms of precipitation. So we have rain, drizzle, glaze, uh, snow. Okay. So this size 
Uh, this form may vary by sizes. Okay, and also it had been categorized, grouped by liquid and frozen precipitation. So for liquid, we have rain and drizzle. And for frozen, we have snow, glaze, sleet, and freezing rain. So let's look on the types of precipitation. For the first type, we have orographic precipitation. So by looking at this figure, where we have the warm moist wind from the ocean, okay, blowing up to the ground, and then is um, there is the hills nearby the uh, ocean. So the warm moist wind will try to rise up, and then it will become cold and condense and drop as precipitation at another at one side that facing the ocean, whereby the remaining dry air will just uh, moving towards the another side of the hills. Now we have the second type is the convective precipitation. Okay, so for convective precipitation, by looking at this figure, you have uh, the hot surface that is ground. Okay, during the evening, during the afternoon. Okay, so the air uh, nearby the hot surface, nearby the ground is hot and moist air. So this air is in a lighter weight as compared to the air that is at the higher level. So the lighter air, we try to move, uh, rise up. And then when at some point, the lighter will uh, accumulate and the cold air will condense as precipitation. So that is conventional precipitation. So the last type is cyclonic precipitation. So as you can see from this figure, the, meet, the meeting of the cold front and warm moist front air. Eh? And then this warm moist front is in a dry, uh, is in a lighter condition, lighter weight. So it will rise up on top of the cold front air, eh? and then it will condense and drop as precipitation on the cold front air eh, area. So that is the three types of precipitation. So how we measure precipitation, we will use non recording gauge. Okay, so this is the example of the equipment. So we will have cylinder inside this bucket. Okay, so, uh, this is a bucket. And then uh, when there is a start of the rain, so we put it on the, on the open space. So at this, uh, when the rain stop, we measure the level of the rain by using this cylinder. And then uh, we also have the recording gauge. So this is the example of recording gauge. We have a funnel and then the, fun, uh, the rain will drop on, on, uh, and enter this bucket. And there is the pen will automatically uh, record the reading of the uh, rainfall. Rainfall rate. And then the another uh, weather radar. So this is the most uh, frequently, frequently used nowadays, modern. This is the tower of weather radar. So this is the illustration of the weather radar. So this uh, illustration indicate the intensity of the rainfall at the respective area. It being indicated by the difference of color. All right, so let's move to the next process that is evaporation. So evaporation is the process by which water is converted from liquid to vapor. Okay, so uh, we have three types of evaporation. So the first one is evaporation from open water body. So it is a normal evaporation that occur 
from open water body like as a uh, river pond. So it will uh, start to trans uh, convert from the liquid phase to the to the gas phase. Okay. So how about actual evapotranspiration? So it is a combination of uh, evaporation and transpiration from land and vegetation. So for, uh, from previous slide, we have seen that the uh, water that been taken up by the roots and then it will release the water vapor to the atmosphere by the leaf. And then how about potential evapotranspiration? From it is uh, occurred from soil when soil moisture is held constant by spraying the land regularly. Meaning is that uh, the wet soil that hold the water, so we cannot as uh, we cannot identify, we cannot easily uh, easily identify whether it is being evap evaporated or it is being infiltrated into the groundwater. So that is the potential evapotranspiration. So this is the factors that affecting evaporation. First, we have solar radiation. So the solar, uh, higher the, sol the solar radiation, uh, we have uh, higher solar radiation, higher solar energy uh, will contribute to the higher rate of evaporation. Okay, the same thing with wind, when there are stronger wind, so the higher rate of evaporation will occur. How about relative humidity? So humidity refers to the amount of water vapor in the air. So when the humidity is high, so the water is quite difficult to evaporate. Same goes to temperature. Temperature, same with the sunlight. Just now, higher sun, higher temperature may have higher evaporation rate. Water quality. So, the presence of dissolved solid in water may reduce the, uh, the what uh, vapor pressure and will reduce the evaporation rate. So this is the relationship of the evaporation rate and the factors that affecting the evaporation rate. So this is equipment being used to measure the evaporation pans. So we have uh, this pan that being uh, put on the exposed sur surface, for example, the field. Okay, so we pour some water at the initial level of this pan. Okay, so we set uh, this experiment, for example, five hours and after five hours, we will measure the drop of the level, the, the final level. So that is the evaporation rate for this particular area. So the next equipment we have at Momitus. So a Momitus is an instrument that measure the loss of water from a weighted porous surface. So it is hard for us to measure the drop of water in this area. So by install this equipment, we can see the drop of the readings, okay? Meaning that the, uh, the soil being, uh, the water from this soil being evaporated to the atmosphere. So this is the estimation of evaporation process. So now I would like to conduct a very simple quiz by using Kahoot. So everyone, uh, please uh, participate in this quiz. So I would like to share the screen. For the Kahoot. Okay, can everyone see the screen? So please, uh, by using your handphone, uh, please join this quiz. 
can everyone see the uh, pin number game pin number yes we can see it clearly all ahead. right uh, so please uh in the pin number I'm waiting for participants. So we have uh, Raihan here, right? So the winner of this quiz, I will uh, give a souvenir. We'll get a souvenir from uh, UITM Pahang. Okay, so we will start our quiz within uh, a second. Can we have um, more participants? We have eleven participants here, twelve participants. I will wait for twenty participants. Can we have 20 participants? It's, it is a very simple quiz, just all about our uh, slide before, previous slide. Fourteen, okay. So I will like just uh, four, 15, one five. Can I, can we have one five? Okay, can we start our quiz? Oh, we want to wait some more. Okay, we start our quiz, right? All right. So get ready. First question. Okay. You need to answer within 10 seconds. 10 seconds. So only four correct and give the correct answer. So who's that? Okay, so really on the first place. Okay, so next question. So get ready in 10 seconds. Just uh, answer in 10 seconds. Get ready. All right, we have six, correct? No, no. Okay, next. Through or false question. Okay. We have six answer it correct. So who is that person? Okay, we have Val. Okay, next question. True or false? Only to answer it correct. Who's that? Okay, so Val. Next question is a quiz question. What is that? All right, so result is the answer. Who answer is correct? Val again. All right, so next. is correct who is that no no all right so seven a uh, seven question the seven question is true or false
Yeah, you have answered it correct. So, who is that person? No, no. All right. So, the eighth question. All right. Ten seconds. Second. Six person. Who is that? All right. So, factors. So, last two questions. Nine person answer it correct. So, who is that? Tiara. Okay, and the last question. True or false? Person answer it correct. So who is the winner? Number three is Z. Number two is Val, and number one is Tiara. Okay, so Tiara, Tiara can give your details for, uh, to the committee. So you will get a souvenir from University Technology Mara. Okay, so we can continue our lecture. Okay, so uh, now we move to the infiltration. Infiltration process. So what is infiltration? So Again, uh, we have looked before when the water enters the soil from the ground surface. Okay, so it can determine the rate for excess and the direct runoff. So the, there are two terms, important terms. Okay, so infiltration capacity, symbol as F that calls the maximum rate at which specified soil in a given condition that can absorb water. Whereas the infiltration rate is infiltration expressed in depth of water per unit time. Okay, so this is all the factors affecting the infiltration. So first we have the soil porosity. So as you can see from this figure, uh, this soil have no pore, no pore spaces. So it is hard for the water to infiltrate in between of this soil. Sorry, Dr. Trotto, yes. uh, have you shared the uh, PowerPoint? Oh, sorry, sorry, PowerPoint, yes, okay. new share. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, can you see? The PowerPoint, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. Thank yes, you. Yes, all right. Okay, again. So this is infiltration. So do I need to repeat? Okay. Uh, I'll just proceed with this, yeah? So this is the uh, soil that have no pores, no pore spaces. So when we have no pores, so the, the water is quite hard to infiltrate between this uh, pore, the soil. As compared to the connected pore spaces, so the water is may easily infiltrate in between of this pore size, pore soil. All right. So next we have the second is the moisture content. So when we have the soil, when we have the soil and uh, mix with the water, so it is the soil water mixture. So the higher moisture content will contribute to the lesser infiltration rate of this soil. Okay, so this is vegetation covers. So this vegetation may increase the infiltration uh, compared to the barren land. How does it happen? So when the uh, ground is fully covered by the grass, so the root of the grass need no water. So the 
So absorb water will be taken up by the roots of the grass and then be released to atmosphere. So that's why the vegetation cover increase the infiltration. However, uh, when there are barren land, so when the rainfall uh, drop onto the barren land, so the rain just erode the barren soil. And then we have the rainfall size. So the larger the rainfall drop, it will cause the higher, uh, the lower infiltration rate. Okay, the lower infiltration rate because the size, it cannot fully absorb, uh, fully, uh, simply absorb into the soil. As compared to the, okay, so the next is the entrapped air. So the entrapped air is the air that contained in the soil. So when there is the entrapped air inside the uh, soil, so it is hard for the water to infiltrate into the soil. Season. So during the dry season, the soil is subject to swelling and shrinking. So it will force uh, the water, it will uh, contribute uh, to the infiltration rate of the of the water. Okay, so this is the slope. The slope also may contribute to the infiltration rate because when there is the land slope, okay, so it will just, it will have just a little effect on the infiltration. So, however, when there are the flat slope, so the infiltration will increase. This is because when you have the flat slope, the water is being stagnant, static on that slope. It cannot move in downward or uh, moving uh, to the lower direction. So that's why it will try to infiltrate into the soil. And last one, we have the man action. So what is man action? So it is the modify the surface of the land by having the pavement road, uh, and then buildings, okay. So that's why uh, it covered the soil, so the infiltration cannot be occur. So this is two instrument we made to measure the infiltration. So we have flooding infiltrometer. So this thing we put on the ground, and then uh, we pour some water into this. Uh, outer ring so this outer ring okay we put at the initial level and then at the end of the experiment we can see we can measure the drop of the water level so that is how we measure the infiltration rate using flooding infiltrometer the next instrument we have run for simulator so this is the equipment and we have like sprinkler on top of this equipment. And then this sprinkler will uh, replicate, duplicate like a uh, rainfall. And then the precipitation will drop on this ground, on this soil, and then this soil will uh, infiltrate the water. So they also have uh, like tube capillary, so we can measure the, uh, infiltration uh, by measuring the capillary uh, level. And then we have stream flow measurement. So the stream flow is important uh, topics in hydrology because it relate, relate to water supply, to control the flood, to design the reservoir uh, for the navigation process, irrigation process, and then for drainage, and then for the water quality and other else. Okay, so we measure the unit by uh, volume. Volume of water moving past a cross section of stream. Okay. So uh, this is the measurement of stage. Okay. So this is the gauge height. Okay, so we can measure the level of the river. Okay, whether it is uh, at the drought season, so the level may be lower 
as compared to the flooding season, rainfall season, the level of this uh, gauge is higher. Okay, so how to measure the stream flow? So conventionally, we have used the like orange, okay? We just release the orange from a starting point, okay? And then the orange will travel to the uh, lower downstream, okay? At the final point. So there we measure the uh, distance over the time taken. So that we call uh so that is how we measure the velocity by using conventional method however when we have another equipment uh wedding rod so it is designed uh, to securely position on the current meter okay so to any desired depth so we put this instrument okay beneath the water and then uh, the water the velocity will uh, the the sensor will will sense the velocity okay and then it will display on the this prop all right so we have also have another equipment sounding weight okay and then uh, this sounding weight can be suspended either by hand line or real line okay when it is not possible to use wedding rod due to deep or swift water, meaning that uh, just now we have what we use wedding rod for a very shallow river, but when we have the uh, deeper river or higher velocity of river, we cannot use the this wedding rod, so we use sounding weight. So we use the boat. Okay, so we just uh, put this equipment beneath the water and then we can measure the readings uh, just uh, by display at this equipment. Okay, so this is the exact, uh, the real things. So it like a fish, okay, so this uh, fish shape, so it will touch the bottom of the river. Okay, measurement of velocity. And then we also have echo sounder. So this echo sounder we use for the uh, larger uh, water body, for example, ocean, okay, and then a large river. So this is uh, by using the sound uh, work based on echo sounding. So uh, the the people, the workers on, on, on the boat on top of the, uh, and then uh, it will uh, reflect the sounding. Okay, so the, 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 uh, the deeper of the river means uh, the reflection will take uh, a longer time. Okay, so this is the river gauging. So basic formula for the uh, velocity is uh, flow rate Q. The symbol is Q equal to the velocity times with the area. Okay. So how about uh, my time? <laughs> it's actually it's already uh, it's finished, already but maybe two minutes more. Maybe <laughs> two minutes more. It's okay. I think that's all from me. Okay. Oh, is it huh. is it okay to stop here? Ah. Oh. I just stop okay. here. All right. Uh, so, maybe. Uh, do you still have uh how many slides more? Oh, I have. Uh, never mind. It's actually <laughs> my lecture notes is hundred slides. So never oh. mind. I think forty minutes is uh not enough to finish all my slides. So never mind. I just stop yeah. here. Maybe in other another time. We can yeah, share maybe we can, knowledge again. Mm, right? Maybe we can continue in the QA, maybe. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. It's thank okay. you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Right. Thank you, for the very excellent presentation. Okay. Stop maybe sharing, we yeah. will con yeah, maybe we can we can continue for the next uh QA. And then uh we uh, will go to
uh, second lecture is uh, this is from uh, Ibu Ainul Firdatun Nisa. Uh, good afternoon, Ibu Ainul Firdatun. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Good afternoon. Yeah, how are you today? Uh, great. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here and also speaking along with Dr. Duraton. So yeah, looking forward. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, before before uh, Ibu Ainul Firdatun uh, delivering her presentation, I will introduce a, a profile of uh, Dr. Uh, Ibu Ainul Firdatun. Uh, for the educational background, uh, for the bachelor degree, she is uh, have a subject in engineering in environmental engineering in ITS, and then for the master master degree. She uh, have a subject in science, what the Master of Science in Water Resource Engineering and Management in University of Stuttgart, Germany. And for the experience, the experience and award uh, at 2014, she is, uh, have Genesis, Urban Development and City Planning Japan Ministry of Foreign and Affairs. And then at 2016, she got the DAAD uh, for uh, Sustainable Water Management, the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research uh, for the research, yes. And then uh, now she is a junior lecturer at ITS Environmental Engineering. And uh, for the in research interest, uh, the uh, Ibu Ainul Firdatun now uh, active in urban water management, especially uh, in sanitation planning and water resource management. Okay, uh, maybe directly I, uh, I will hang over this uh, time for uh, Ibu Firdatun Nisa to delivering the presentation. Time is yours, Ibu Firdatun. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Budina. So I'm gonna start uh, to share my screen. I hope um, I hope you you all start to see my screen right now. So yeah. So for the next uh, 30 minutes, I try to explain a brief information regarding the resource efficient sanitation planning. So as introduced before, my name is Anil Vida Tunisa. I'm based in Surabaya with Institute of Technology School in November. Um, because I've uh, Miss Dina already introduced myself, I'm just gonna um, go directly with um, the content of the lecture. So, for the first part, I will try to give a brief explanation regarding the SDG six and also the implementation in Indonesia. And afterward, I will talk a little bit about uh, the urban sanitation, especially in the global south. And then um, in the last part, I will try to give a brief explanation regarding the resource efficient sanitation planning. So when we talk about um, sustainable development goals, number goal number six, we always think that it always around drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene. But uh, in reality, it's more than that. There are many aspects that also are being considered when we talk about um, the goal number six. And what are they? Um, the SDG six also discussed related to topics such as water pollution and then water use efficiency, water resource management, water um, ecosystem, and also um, aspects such as international cooperation and multi-level partnership. And when we talk about sustainable sanitation, um, not only that it correlates or relates with other indicators within the goal number six, but it also correlates with um, with other, other indicators from the, the global development goals beyond the SDG 6, such as from, uh, from this graph here. So, so this is the linkages of sustainable sanitation to the SDGs beyond the SDG 6. Um, so I got this graph from um, the recent publication from the SUSANA, the Sustainable Sanitation Alliance. Um, the book is called Sanitation Journey. So when we see here, we understand that the sustainable sanitation has um, a strong relationship with other, with other SDGs beyond SDG 6. For example, if we talk about SDG 14 here, 
the life of below waters. When we implement sustainable sanitation, uh, it effectively will um, reduce the potential of the marine pollution because of the untreated wastewater. And then another example if, uh, is if we talk about um, implementation of sustainable sanitation, it also actually promotes the human health by breaking the disease cycles. Also, when we talk about sustainable sanitation within the city context, it actually relates um, with the sustainable cities or goal number 11. Uh, we know that sanitation itself is actually the basic services that everyone meets, everyone in the world. And it's actually required if we want to provide a clean and also to provide a livable environment. And uh, where are we now? So when we talk about drinking water and sanitation that, is, that are monitored within the SDG 6. So these are the information from the UN that I gathered. Um, I just want to point out on the only two, uh, two lines here for the basic drinking water and basic sanitation because these two components are actually higher than um, the goal itself uh, because the indicator itself, the indicator says that um, the proportion of the population using safely managed sanitation services, including hand rest, soap and water. But here uh, we see from the graph that at the global scales, actually the world is more ready toward the basic drinking water and basic sanitation. So, so yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So we see here from the graph that uh, from the year 2000 to the year 2017, there, is, there was an increase actually from 81% for the drinking water to 90% for uh, in the year 2017. Um, the increase happened also for the basic sanitation. We have an increase from the year 2000 from uh, 59 to, um, no, sorry, 56 to, uh, to 74 in the year 2017. So there is an increase. And what about the implementation in Indonesia? How is it going right now? So we see here that according to the report by the Joint Monitoring Program, um, the implementation of the drinking water and sanitation services are quite um quite quite okay because we try to compare it with uh, the global average we see at the national level um indonesia has already provided 80 uh, percent of the population with basic services for the drinking water and for the sanitation uh, the government has already provided uh, the proportion with um basic sanitation for uh, 72 percent so it's really interesting because the safely managed drinking water and sanitation are not reported here, not uh, not because that the implementation of the safely managed is actually not available in Indonesia, but it is available and I have seen uh, the case in many places in Indonesia. Maybe it is because um, the implementation is still raw, therefore uh, it is not reported in the monitoring program. And when we discuss about um, the component of the drinking water sanitation, we see that it is composed by a self-limited surfaces, basic surfaces, limited surfaces, unimproved, and also open defecation. Of course, uh, the ultimate goal is that everyone uh, with access to universal, um, universal access of drinking water and sanitation, but uh, according to indicator that has been mentioned earlier, that we want to have a self-limited system. And what is the supplementary system itself? So supplementary is the use of the improved facilities, which are not shared with other households and where excreta are safely disposed in situ or transported and treated outside. And when we see uh, the basic surfaces and also limited surfaces, it also mentioned regarding the improved facilities. So what are actually the improved facilities? So improved facilities covers technologies such as a flush or poor flush toilet that is connected to a pipe sewer system or whether it's connected to um, septic tank or pit latrines to ensure that uh, there is no contamination of warm from the feces to the human. And I want to uh, present um, the result 
from the national census regarding the provision of drinking water sanitation in Indonesia because last year in 2020 uh, we had a national census and the result is interesting because um, so we see that we have in Indonesia there there are over three uh, 30 provinces in Indonesia and then um, the most uh, the most um, crowded island is Java, Java Island, and then uh, the provision of uh, basic services such as water and uh, sanitation also carries um, between province. So here are the provision of drinking water sanitation um, with a blue, a dark blue color here, and also purple. Um, but this um, for the province beyond the Java Islands. Um, the next slide here is the result from the Java Islands. So if you see in the far left here is where the capital of Jakarta uh, present. If you look into the percentage here, the proportion of the population with uh, so the government mentioned that um, in the national census that they only include um, appropriate uh, accesses and appropriate accesses cover safely managed accesses and also basic services. So it covers two uh, two components of the uh, of the SDGs that is currently monitored. So if we see here in the capital of Jakarta, um, the proportion of the population with uh, appropriate drinking water surfaces almost reach hundred percent. And it goes also with the sanitation profession with 93%. If we look into the province where I live, so in the in the in the right part of the East Java, um, here, here is East Java, the profession is still uh, lower than Jakarta, but if we compare it with the national average, uh, we were still higher, higher than the national average. So the national average is for the drinking water is 90%. So I believe uh, we are on track for the SDG goals. And then for the sanitation is uh, still uh, 79%. So uh, it requires uh, more work compared to the drinking water provisions. So uh, when we discuss about um, the result of the census, of course, the government has already uh, plan in mind and then they already have a written plan in the, the midterm development plan for the year 2020 to 2024. And um, the goal for the water and sanitation is the ultimate goal is to have, of course, universal access to safe water and sanitation facilities for all Indonesians. And the indicator is the increasing percentage of household with appropriate basic surface and also safely managed sanitation and drinking water access. The target is 90% uh, for the sanitation and for the drinking water is 100% by 2024. So it's uh, we are we are together looking forward for for the implementation of the plan. And why actually we need to have a safe water and sanitation? Because we want to provide um, uh, full access for the communities because it is really essential. Why it's essential? Because um, it actually contributes to the reduction of the stunting rates and also the reduction of the water pollution. Why it is related to the stunting rates? I'm going to present you the result from one of the uh, from the risk by the night at all in 2016, it says that um, the fatal growth restriction and uninfluent sanitation are actually leading risk factor for stunting in developing countries. Although those two are not the only reason, but um, there are other factors also contribute to the stunting, but they are the, the, major, the major factor contributing to the stunting. So when we discuss about um, the plan that have been uh, written by the government of Indonesia, it also consists of several projects uh, that need to be implemented nationwide. Um, the budget allocated for the uh, for the sanitation related project are um, around 9.8 billion US dollars, and it covers projects as construction of a new centralized and decentralized wastewater treatment 
and then uh, construction of other technology that relates uh, to the to the sanitation facilities. And then other important part is the implementation of city sanitation strategy, with which I will explain again later. So we move on to the urban sanitation. Uh, when we discuss urban sanitation in the context of Indonesia, it's 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 interesting and it's actually um, complex because. For example, here, if we see the city of Jakarta, uh, the city is actually composed by several types of settlement. The first is the city center itself, and then the second is housing complex. The third is, uh, we call it kampung, and it, it, it's actually densely populated settlement. And then uh, the last one is peri-urban area. When we discuss about kampung in particular, it's sometimes also referred as informal settlement, but not always informal settlement. Why? Because it, 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 we see from the urban planning perspective, we understand that Indonesia Kampung is the original version of housing in Indonesia. And then in the capital of Jakarta, Kampung is the result of urbanization where people who move to the capital, they couldn't afford to rent apartment or uh, have a large uh, house and, and the housing complex, so they decided to settle in a densely populated settlement. So that's um, that's uh, that's quite um, quite complex if we discuss more related to the types of the settlements. But uh, what I want to mention here that um, different type of settlement also have different type of scenarios, and then. Um, if scenario uh, has the potential uh, to pollute the environment if not properly managed. Um, the city center might have uh, advanced technology and then the densely, densely populated settlements, they sometimes don't have or have uh, uh, safe technology or supplemented services. So yeah, and there are, there are many possible scenarios and there are many possible technology that could apply, that could be applied in Indonesia. And particularly, um, particularly in, in big cities uh, like Jakarta. So here is the example of the nice uh, SFP diagram, the, the sheet for the diagram. Um, so the, the quick explanation for the SFP is uh, the, uh, the diagram, the tool that is initiated by uh, by uh, the by uh, Susana and also uh, funded by uh, GIZ and also Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It actually tells us uh, how much of the wastewater or fecal flows, uh, fecal waste flow that is uh, properly treated and also safely disposed and also which part of the fecal waste flow that is actually goes to uh, environment or we say it's not treated properly. So this is the example from the Bali Papan and then the, there is an interesting part about, about this diagram is that the each city in Indonesia has been requested to submit uh, the flow the waste flow diagram for their sanitation strategic document. So it's interesting. And then we have over, I think we have over two hundred cities and regencies in Indonesia. And then I'm hoping that all of the cities submit uh, the diagram, and then they could eventually use the diagram to implement their sanitation strategy. So these are some of the uh, examples from the informal settlements uh, worldwide. Okay, um, sorry, just quick technical issue. So, Okay, um, I'm gonna continue. So, so these are some examples from the informal settlements worldwide. Uh, we have examples such as Peru and from Kenya, where they have their own system to pro to um, to provide um, their community with sustainable access accesses for sanitation uh, using uh, technology such as UDDT, and then they implement condominial sewers. So. Um, how the technology looks like is something like this. So these are the technology that has been adopt adopted in, in Kenya and also in Peru. So um, the UDDT technology uh, is utilized uh, within the scope of container-based sanitation system. So the technology actually, actually separates the urine and the feces. Uh, maybe this technology is not uh, common in Indonesia, but I believe it's not available 
I think it's not available in Indonesia because most of the people in Indonesia are using the poor flash or the system flash toilet. But if I recall the time where I visited my, my grandma houses a um, couple of years ago uh, in, the, in the village, we still use uh, the concept of dry toilet. So, so yeah, maybe a few decades ago, the concept of dry toilet and UDDD are actually available, but um, it's not uh, used anymore or it's not common anymore once uh, the people already discover um, the function of the poor flush toilet. But the concept itself for the UDD is that it protect a uh, human health uh, from the contact from from the feces and also from the urines. And the purpose to separate the stream itself because we want to uh, we want to recover the nutrients from the urines because if the urine is stored for a long time, the pathogen is. Uh, eliminated and then we can use the urine as uh, fertilizer because it's rich nutrient and then for the feces we could use it for uh, the combination of the biogas or we could use it as the solid cover so so yeah it's it's easier in terms of um, recovering uh, the substances from the technology and then it has been implemented by social mentors in Kenya with uh, the name Samarity and also in Peru with uh, the name Exwano. And this is the example uh, from Indonesia and also uh, from India where, uh, where they have the idea to, uh, to make, to connect the system uh, to those who usually use septic tank and then uh, they also provide service for emptying their septic tank. And then they also provide surface that they also will um, uh, they will treat uh, the sludge originated from the septic tank. So so yeah, it, it, in Indonesia it is implemented by uh, the iWash for US aid, and then for uh, India it is implemented under the uh, SPM program. The SPM program itself is um, aiming to provide a toilet for all Indians. So. Uh, if you're interested with uh, this information, you could uh, just Google uh, with these keywords, and then you you will find a lot of information regarding this this program. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move uh, related to sustainable sanitation, and then uh, providing um, services and infrastructure for uh, for those um, living in the cities or uh, in the urban areas. When we discuss about sustainable sanitation. I recall the time that um, one of the person that I met during the webinar mentioned that if we have option to build infrastructure that could last 20 years, why don't we just build that infrastructure instead of choosing the ones that only last two or five years? That's exactly what I had in mind. So the concept of sustainable infrastructure is that we want to uh, include all the aspects um, that actually contribute uh, where the community itself could enjoy the sanitation infrastructure and the community itself are willing to uh, willing to uh, involve in the in the management and also in the operation because it actually spark uh, their joy because it's actually a design because uh, because they really need it because it's it's uh, it fulfills their need of uh, of having a sustainable sanitation and uh, especially um, with regard to the condition of the environment or um, the, the location of the community, whether it is located in the sub-Saharan Africa or whether it's located in the in the uh, in the mountain. So it depends on the on the on the location of the community so that's why i move on uh, into uh, the sanitation planning that considers um, resource recovery so i had um, experience to implement uh, the method called santiago and then uh, we we implement that method for the case study of lima in peru um, and the research itself is actually was actually conducted within the 
the bigger project that is belong that belongs to the uh, the the Ministry of the Richard from uh, Germany, and then the project itself it's called Pras. So the aim of the project is that. Uh, they want to promote a sustainable water um, resources. And then they want to promote the concept where we can utilize or we can uh, supply community with drinking water and sanitation uh, in the arid environment where water are not available throughout the years. So yeah, so this, um, this is uh, this is really interesting uh, because uh, our research was implemented and um, was was uh, conducted in uh, the community of Quebrada Verde in Lurin Valley. Uh, it's located in the in the bottom part of Lima. Here, if you can see the the map on the right. Um, so the red red color here is uh, the location of the informal settlements in Lima, and then the the location of the Quebrada Verde is somewhere uh, in the bottom right. And if you see uh, the photo on the left here is um, uh, a, a little after view of uh, how the community looks like and then uh, the environment there and then you see there there is um, in the um, there is a Lurian river far in the in the back but uh, it's the water doesn't really flow uh, every day throughout the year so, so yeah that's, that's quite dry actually the location. So the objective itself um, to promote a sustainable wastewater reuse concept by providing recommendation on the appropriate sanitation system for Lima's uh, urban settlements that could be used for input into decision making processes using uh, the Santiago procedure um, that is also considered um, resource without free. So the Santiago method, I'm not going to go into detail in the method, but in general, uh, using this method, we could generate um, uh, 100,000 of technology uh, possible option that could be implemented in certain areas. And then uh, the, method, uh, the method could also choose which system that is the most appropriate or, or the most um, uh, recommended to be to be considered in the decision making processes. And then the method also able to tell us uh, the amount of the substances that will be recovered from the system. So that's uh, the Santiago in, in brief. Uh, for the input, we use uh, this fortitude technologies that might be some of you are I'm not familiar with technology, but in general, we try to use the concept of sanitation pollutants that um, the, the wastewater or the feces are actually contained and then transported and then treated in certain places or uh, after that, uh, the product is being reused or disposed safely. So these are the technology, the technology that we use for the input. And then uh, if you might wonder the technology, so these are the, some of the examples of the technology that, uh, that we use for, for the input of the method. So we use the UDDT because it's also common in Latin America. We use uh, the cistern flush toilet and also poor uh, flush toilet because it's also common and in, in, in everywhere in the world. And then for the containment, uh, we didn't use holding them, but it's just, it's just an overview of the containment. So other than the technology, we also need uh, some criteria to be considered because we want to have sustainable infrastructure. So what are the components, the components that, uh, that are included in the concept of sustainable infrastructure uh, are that uh, the technology or the system must environmentally sound and then economically, economically affordable and then uh, socially acceptable. And then uh, we also consider the institution. But in the inputs, we didn't consider uh, financials because it creates trade off between parties. So we didn't include that. And then uh, afterward, after, after we have the result, we could discuss. Uh, regarding the financial within the stakeholders or to those who are interested with uh, with funding of the of the implementation so that's that's another story so here's uh, the summary of the technology that uh, the technology that we use 
um, uh, the technology uh, that we used were uh, 42 technology and the number of the criteria that we used were, um, were 18. So, so yeah, just add a summary. Um, using the Santiago method, um, not only the technology and the criteria that we need to uh, gather or uh, list for the input, but we also need to uh, describe each technology and then describe uh, each criteria as um, distribution. So, so we use modeling. So we try to convert the technology um, with with regard to the certain criteria, whether the technology requires 24 hours of water uh, a day or whether technology uh, will will run without water so we try to describe that into the probability functions it uh, also goes to the to the uh, to the criteria so yeah if if you're interested with the method i suggest that you read the following journal um i also mentioned that the method also uh, allows us to understand the number of the sub tenses that could be recovered from the system um, in this case study, we use uh, four types of substances. We use total nitrogen, total phosphorus, uh, we use total solids, and also we use water. So we want to understand um, how many water can be recovered from certain system, or we want to understand how many nitrogen that can be recovered uh, from certain, certain, certain system, because uh, when we understand that, we could use this um, uh, this this just uh, this result as um, additional input into decision making processes. Another another thing that I want to add is that this method doesn't uh, doesn't aim to replace expert knowledge. So uh, we we cannot use it to build uh, the technology directly or to build infrastructure directly, but. We use this method uh, before the urban planning or uh, sanitation planning processes, before the decision making processes, because sometimes uh, we are not sure which type of technology that we could consider in the decision making processes. So with this method, uh, we, we could understand the uh, various technology that are available worldwide. So, so yeah, that's, that's the goal. Um, so these are one of the results, uh, the, uh, the system that is being recommended from, from the system, uh, sorry, from, from the methodology, from the method that we, we use. So, so these are the system that scores uh, the highest among uh, compared to others. So um, the, the methodology um, tells us that the system with UDDP and then with the container-based system where uh, where the product of the UDDT being transported manually um, to the to the application of urine or to the soli uh, solid disposal app are the most uh, one of the most appropriate uh, compared to others. And then it also promising because uh, it could recover over eighty percent of the nutrients from the system. And it's interesting for those. Uh, we we'll want to uh, we we'll, we'll want to uh, implement resort recovery for the sanitation planning or for the community who are really really want to uh, recover nutrients from their wastewater system. Um, if we talk about water, of course, the system doesn't promise much stuff because the UDD the UDD itself doesn't require much water, even doesn't doesn't does not really need water to run. So if we want to look for a technology or a system that uh, recovers much water, of course, the first criteria that we need to fulfill is that um, the settlement has to have 24 seconds of water, and then the technology uh, requires water to run it. For example, uh, the pore flash toilet. Um, yeah, so that's... Uh, that's uh, that's the case if you want to recover as much water from the system. But if you prefer to recover nutrients when, where, uh, where the prison of water is not continuous, so you could use technology that uses less water. So that's a, that's a simple explanation uh, 
uh, that I could explain from this. So, um, so the method that we use also tells us how much of the substances that that leads to the environment. So we know the amount of the substances that, for example, uh, leak to the surface water, and then the amount of the substances that goes to the soil and or, or evaporate to the air. So we understand uh the the mass uh, the mass balance we understand uh because the the method uh has quantified the amount of the substances from uh, from the input uh by by the input i mean uh, the user interface technology which is the UDDT to the disposal technology here so so yeah that's so we know the numbers but i didn't show the number here for the sake of time okay so so here's um, here's the results. Here's the result. So, uh, so for, from the first two technologies, we could generate uh, over two hundred sixty thousand uh, sanitation system from from the system, uh, from the from the from the modeling. Uh, imagine that you have those a lot of system, and then you might wonder which type of system that are the best uh, compared to other. So, uh, so the tech, um, the the method could tell us um, which tech, which system could uh, show uh, the best monitors, and the system are uh, the system with urine diversion and biogas production system. And uh, the result of the mass flow analysis is advantageous to be used as sporting information for. Uh, this is in preferences or to be considered in, in the next step, for example, for the financial talking, uh, if some party uh, more interested to the technologies that requires like less electricity, for example, or requires less uh, operation and maintenance, for example. So, so yeah, that's uh, so this this option could be beneficial for that. And uh, yeah, the, the note that I put here is that the system option are solely an ex, ex ante estimate and we all we we only know the appropriateness not the performance of the technology and it doesn't want to replace the expert knowledge when the, the expert or the engineer normally needs to think harder um how to have uh, the best performance uh, for uh, the infrastructure that they built so so yeah that's that's the note that i want to make so with that, I would like to conclude my presentation with three uh, sentence here or two points here. The first is sanitation planning is context specific. Uh, one case might or might not be suitable to be replicated in other areas. And the second is incorporating the resource recovery concept in sanitation system planning is one way to realize a sustainable infrastructure, especially if, for example, you use uh, San Diego for the planning. And last is uh, the SDG number six is not the ultimate goal, but rather a tool that can be used to help us providing equitable accesses for everyone. So yeah, um, I think that's all that I could uh, deliver for my session. I will hand uh, this session back to the moderator. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That's very, very excellent presentation. Maybe uh, some of the participants can uh, give applause. <laughs> okay, uh, for the next session, uh, we continue to the Q&A session. Uh, so for the, uh, the, the all participants who have the question, can uh, raise hand to, to give the question for the lecture for the speaker. Okay, and maybe anybody want, uh, want to give the question? Maybe anyone uh, have uh, any question for the Dr. Durotul or Ibu Firdatun? Okay, uh, while we waiting for the participant uh, to give the question, I May I have a question for Dr. Turoto? Yes. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Okay. Uh, that's uh, your presentation is about uh, fundamental uh, knowledge about the water, water system, water uh, cycle, hydrological, and etc. And 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 
we know that uh, today uh, we we face the global warming right mm -hmm. we face the global warming and uh, the global warming uh, have a very, uh, and uh, some factor that may be disturb the cycle of hydrological and sometimes uh, make uh, give the effect for the people who work in seasoning in seasoning and depend on the uh, season uh, maybe uh, maybe dr durotun uh, have uh, some uh, opinion uh, how to how to uh, how we as a intellectual or maybe as uh, the student in a university uh, to help the people who have the uh, uh, effect from the this this uh, problem of global warming okay so uh, problem of global warming so normally we know that um, due to the um, excessive uh, we call uh, log activities like uh, so uh, there are no forests uh, so it's being uh, cut by the unresponsible uh, author unresponsible party so that may contribute to the uh, global warming and also may contribute to the uh, flood uh, flood disasters so uh, for me how we want to uh, we must educate our our younger uh, generation on how uh, we must appreciate our water system body. So, and also we educate uh, our, our citizen, our, uh, our villages nearby the rivers, nearby the uh, ocean, uh, not to pollute our water body system. Right, uh, so that is just uh, uh, the awareness of the people uh, that will save our Earth uh, uh, from the global warming uh, disasters and uh, also other disasters. Uh, so I think the awareness is important. Okay, okay. Thank you, Dr. Drodon. So education okay. and uh, awareness uh, that's important thing but, and then uh, uh, before I have another question for the second speaker maybe some of the participants uh, have a question Ibu Firdatun already uh, delivering a excellent uh, presentation about uh, uh, the how to the cell in it up i mean how uh, the engineering how to uh, have a program to make a good sanitation anybody want to uh, give a question uh, excuse me i want to ask a question oh okay okay yes please mas takir okay uh, this question is for miss firda so uh, I just wondering for the possible scenarios in Indonesia cases, I see that there are four scenarios which are city center, housing complex, densely populated settlement, and very urban area. So uh, my question is, I just wondering, is it possible if the scenario of housing complex is, uh, we use that scenario on city center too, or vice versa, or maybe the densely populated statement and the city center and vice versa also. Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, great question. So first thing first, the scenarios that I explained uh, in the, my, my presentation was just um, not the only option. It's, um, th there, are, there are many possible scenarios, but uh, we need to remember that around 60% 60, 60 of the population in Indonesia, they use septic tanks. So each house has their own septic tank. So it's like our own door because uh, each house must have septic tank. And then uh, landed housing uh, is very common in Indonesia first. And then apartment is not is not that common in Indonesia. And normally apartment are scattered in city center or in the certain area where uh, there, there are only apartment or only uh, 
uh, shopping center. So, so normally when um, when there is um, funding, also when there is a budget for for those living or have an apartment or the shopping center normally have uh, their 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 own budget because they could afford to have a centralized system. And then the government also they don't hesitate hesitate to. Uh, to ask them to hey you you need to uh, you need to connect your system with our centralized system, and then uh, because they are they are the ones who are occupying the city centers, and then it means they have money and they have funding, and then they have to connect their sewage. Um, they 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 have to connect their wastewater system to the to the centralized system. But uh, often in Indonesia we we see that in many housing complex they have septic tank and then normally they will they will call the the sliding surface to empty the septic tank once in two or four years but some households they don't know that we need to empty the septic tank maybe if i ask one of you here uh, when was the last time your household empty your septic tank maybe some of you you don't remember when when was the time and uh, so this is the thing when we discuss septic tank in Indonesia, because uh, at the global scale, um, the term septic tank is rather biased, and then it refers to different terms because uh, actually in, in, the, in the real terminology of the septic tank, it protects the water uh, to, uh, to uh, go to the environment and then they, that, that could pollute the environment. But, uh, in many cases, in Indonesia, the septic tank uh, is not well designed, and then uh, there's also the potential where the wastewater that enters the septic tank could uh, finally pollute the environment, could finally pollute um, the water well, uh, because uh, in many households, especially in the village area, they use uh, their own well. They, they use their own private well for the, the source of clean water. And then they also have a septic tank. Uh, we also need to make sure that, um, that the septic tank and the, the clean water well is, is uh, enough uh, separate, uh, is, has a certain distance to maintain that uh, it doesn't pollute um, the clean water. So, so yeah, there are, there are many possible scenarios. And then when you use, um, and the, the method of San Diego, you could generate all possible scenarios that could happen in, for example, in one city or one, one, uh, one, uh, one district, for example. So yeah, it's just the, the most common type of the system that I presented in, in, the, in the presentation. Uh, does, is it clear so far? Uh, yes, it is clear. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ibu Firdatun. Okay, for the next question, uh, does anybody uh, have a question? Yeah, this is a question from Ibu Nastiti. Uh, to Dr. Duroto, I wonder if we can build, sorry, we can build uh, our own water seat because I read that we can actually use rainwater for daily needs such as software. Sewering and then flushing toilet, watering plants, and many things else. Do you think it applicable in Indonesia and Malaysia or in tropical country context? Considering we got long period of rainy season. Nah, that's a question from Ibu Nastiti. Please, uh, Dr. Duroto. Yeah, uh, the question is regarding the rainwater harvesting, right? So we want to use the rainwater as our source of uh, water supply instead of uh, the apa, normal water supply being supplied to uh, being billing to the uh, to the uh, resident area. So I think uh, yes, uh, this is uh, another alternative water sources that we can build uh, a tank uh, connecting uh, by by collecting our, uh, the rainwater from our rooftop our, of our house. So, uh, however, to daily use uh, for flushing toilet and watering plants, uh, uh, it is possible to use uh, that uh, rainwater, uh, rainwater directly. But 
um, by considering uh, the users that uh, may have contact with our skin body uh, and also for drink purpose, uh, we must uh, treat that uh, rainwater first uh, to make sure there is no contaminant due to the uh, dust or uh, any other uh, pollutants, uh, uh, parameters, uh, nitrogen or whatever, in, uh, gases or whatever. So uh, it is important for us to treat first uh, for our uh, for the uh, drinking purpose. But for the uh, daily use for flushing toilet, watering plant, uh, we can use the rainwater. Is it answering your question? How, oh, Miss uh, Ibu Nastiti? Nasti, ah, Ibu Nastiti. Okay, okay. I think it's uh, answered the question. Okay. Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, for the next uh, question, uh, anybody have a co another question? Or uh, if uh, there's no question again, uh, I have uh, one question more for uh, Ibu Firdatun or maybe Ibu Durotun. Uh, for the concept of su sustainable infrastructure, uh, Firdatun, Ibu Firdatun has said that uh, that's a concept for sustainable infrastructure and that's uh, some, some pillar, some pillar to to make it uh, uh, to get uh, to to get the goal like that and uh, actually uh, this is a system not individual not individual problem but uh, I mean not individual uh, uh, thing have to do so Bu uh, Firdatun what do you think uh, are there what is the what is the main problem? What's the main problem that you solely become the barrier to get the sustainable infrastructure goal? I mean, uh, sometimes uh, maybe I don't know. Maybe Doc Ibu uh, yeah. uh, have some uh, what the main problem and uh, what have to do uh, we as a uh, intellectual in university to uh, to. Uh, uh, to, I mean, to go to get the goal of this uh, uh, the M. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I often encounter such problems. So the first thing I have in mind always there are always different uh, interests between stakeholders and maybe academia. So the ac academia community they they have the answer or they have uh, all answers to all problems in this world like. Um, as the as the chemists, they have their own solution, and then as the lawyer, they they have their own solution, and as the engineer also, they have their own solution. But the maybe if I could say like uh, the challenge itself, I don't say the problem. <laughs> I'm just saying the challenge. The challenge would be uh, when we present the idea to the government or the stakeholder involved, because sometimes when we think about infrastructures. The first thing that they come in mind is concrete. If we don't see concrete in the field or in the community, they don't think that it's infrastructure is there. But in reality, uh, we already we currently shifting from the gray infrastructures to the green infrastructures where we rely on uh, the natural environment, such as. When, for example, if we, we try to uh, to uh, treat uh, the wastewater using the constructed wetlands. So you don't see the concrete there. You might see, but you just need for the bottom liners. You you just uh, you, say, you just see the plants that, that are being used for treating the wastewaters. And sometimes, often, often time that the governments don't think that this is infrastructure, but um, uh, to give a, a quick a quick explanation, uh, this also has a good a good performance in treating the wastewater, especially uh, in regard to the effluent of septic tank, and in particular, uh, maybe Dr. Durotel could elaborate more than that. Okay, thank you, Ibu Firdatun. Uh, maybe Dr. Uh, Durotel, 
uh, I can give uh, are there uh, same 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 challenge <laughs> not problem but challenge <laughs> are there same challenge in Malaysia maybe about uh, water uh, waste water management and how uh, how your opinion how to solve it thank you right uh, so uh, in Malaysia it also have um, the challenges to change our perception on the sustainable water resource for example uh, water rainwater harvesting just now uh, that uh, we know in Malaysia and uh, other Asian countries uh, in Malaysia we have a uh, lot 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 of um, rainwater intensity and for intensity is uh, quite um, enough for us to build the system infrastructure for that particular purpose. However, when it involves uh, the initial cost for to develop the infrastructure, uh, for to develop the tank, to develop uh, the pump system, and then the drainage, the piping system, and then uh, the uh, the organization or any uh, party need to involve in, need to invest uh, quite a large amount of money to to implement that to execute the uh, uh, project so that's why um, if uh, we uh, as academia can educate uh, this uh, organization uh, there we uh, there is uh, potency, potential for us to uh, make a better future with our water resources and also wastewater uh, treatment process. I think uh, that's from me. Again, education and awareness and, and every individual thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, we still have about uh, five minutes uh, before uh, and this uh, agenda, maybe one of the participants participant, uh, have any question? No? <laughs> okay, uh, there are uh, no no question again. Maybe for the last uh, for the last uh, agenda, maybe Ibu Firdatun or Ibu Durotun have a close close uh, apa, uh, closing statement for this agenda. Okay. Uh, so I hope. Uh, my a very basic knowledge, a very fundamental knowledge on the water resource, uh, the origin of water uh, may uh, have, uh, have um, uh, give you some ideas, uh, some uh, new new ideas on how uh, we need, how important of our water resource, uh, the uh, uh, how we need uh, to preserve our water uh, because uh, it's not uh, for us, but also for our future. So that's all from me. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Durotul Ain. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, excellent uh, uh, presentation and your a lot uh, knowledge about uh, fundamental of, of water. And the last from Ibu Firdatun, uh, maybe for the closing statement. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, just want to point out that two days ago we celebrated the World Water Day. I just want to uh, raise uh, this issue to everyone that water is the human right, and then whenever you have, whenever we have a chance to reserve waters, uh, it's not only for us but uh, for for the future for 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 the community or for the human being that lives after us. And so, yeah, so be, be wise <laughs> when you're using waters and hopefully um, we meet again in the future. And for those who are interested with um, the presentation that I, I, I did to earlier today, so you could reach me personally to ask for the resources or or maybe if, if you were interested to come to Surabaya, so yeah, just just let us know. Yeah, and also I'm I'm really glad that I speak uh, today along with Dr. Durato. Um, it's it's really nice to to meet you, Dr. Durato. And hopefully, if the pandemic 
it's offer we could uh, gather in person. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ibu Firda Tunisa. Okay, this is uh, the end of uh, the agenda. Thank you very much for joining uh, and uh, to be the speaker of uh, today's uh, in uh, water water days. <laughs> and uh, thank you for all the participants for joining this GLS SDGs today. Uh, see you next time. And uh, uh, I think. Uh, this is finished for my job desk. <laughs> for sorry if I have uh, any uh, any mistakes. Uh, and then, uh, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Time uh, uh, hangover to uh, MC. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Miss Dina, for bringing this very interesting session. And thank you very much, Dr. Durato and Ms. Firda, for the excellent lecture today. Please give applause to our speaker and moderator by using the Zoom reaction feature. Furthermore, we would like to present a certificate wording to both of our speakers and also our moderator today. So the first certificate is presented for Dr. Durato Ain Toliwan. Next is the certificate present for Miss Aino Firdatun Nisa. And the last certificate present for Miss Nisa Once again, thank you very much to Dr. Durato, Miss Firda, and Miss Dina for your availability on today's guest lecture series. Okay, before we end our lecture today, we invite you all participants, as well as the honorable speakers and moderator, to take a group photo. So all participants, please open your camera. Okay, uh, as we have two slides, so please keep your smile until we finish the photo session. Okay, so for the first slide, I will count one, two, three. Okay, so for the next slide, one, two, three. Great. Yeah. Now we have finished the group photo. Then, for the participants, please fill the feedback form through the link bit.ly slash feedback gls that you can also see on the Zoom chat room. The deadline for filling the feedback form is one hour after we finish this session. We want to remind you, the participant who will get the stamp is the participant who come on time, during this event until the end, and also fill the feedback form. Finally, we have reached the end of today's guest lecture series, and we sincerely apologize for any mistakes we may have made in presenting as Master of Ceremony and Committee. Thank you very much to our honorable speakers, moderator, and all participants for the attention and cooperation. We will see you in the next guest lecture series on SDGs next week. We will have one session on Tuesday and two parallel sessions on Wednesday. Okay, so for the session on Tuesday, the topic is about the quality education for all critical and political perspective, which will bring by Dr. Miguel Antonio Lim and Dr. Arfan Fahmi. And for the first session on Wednesday, the topic is about supply chain management digitalization, supply chain post-COVID, which will be bring by Associate Professor Ferry G. And for the second session on Wednesday is about SDGs in solid waste management, paradigm shift in waste conversion to well and semi-decentralized of solid waste management 
which will be up by Dr. Pramila Tamunahidu, Dr. Warma Dewanti, and the moderator is Dr. Dian Saptarini. So that's all for session. Good afternoon and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you. 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 It's a pleasure to have all of you here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. But, uh, thank you. So thank you for coming to today's GLS SDGs. Uh, see you next week, and I will end the session in three, two, one. Bye bye.